Well, good morning. Thank you, everyone. I'm Nick, as Steph said, from Microsoft, uh, where I work as a, an SRE on Azure, or Azure. I never know which one the branding team wants me to say. I think it's Azure, but that makes me as a Brit feel very strange. Um, anyway, thank you for coming. You are the real heroes, because it's 9 AM on a Friday on the last day of the conference, and you're all here, so thank you. Today, uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, how we can learn more from production incidents. And the first thing to say is that this is not entirely my talk. Uh, this is a talk that I co-wrote with my colleague, Jessica DeVita, um, whose Twitter handle is up there, as is mine. Um, and beyond myself and Jessica, this is also a talk that builds on the work of many other people much more intelligent than myself. Um, people whose names you'll hear me mention during the talk, Richard Cook, John Allspore, and a number of others who've been trying to introduce some of the ideas that I'm going to talk about to the industry. So almost everybody in this room, I imagine, uh, works on a team that maintains uh, or operates a production service. And unless you have somehow discovered something that the rest of the industry hasn't, I imagine that your production service has outages in production. And perhaps you do some kind of post-mortem or uh, root cause analysis or some process after you have an outage. And maybe you, maybe you have a feeling that those processes tend to be something of a, a chore rather than something of real meaningful value. Perhaps you experience the same kinds of incidents over and over again. Perhaps Professor Leveson's talk on Wednesday morning when she talked about how the kinds of systems that we work on are different and require different techniques to understand how they fail, perhaps that resonated with you. If any of that is true, this talk is for you. But I'm going to start with a story, a story about a plane. I don't know all of the details of this story, because the plane in question is this one, a B-17. It was a war plane from the Second World War, and some of the details of of, of what happened to this plane remain secret. But what we do know is that during World War II, this aircraft, the B-17 Flying Fortress, was involved in a series of accidents. These accidents happened repeatedly over an extended period of time, but I'm happy to tell you that they weren't particularly serious accidents. Nobody, in all likelihood, was hurt or seriously injured by these accidents. In each case, what would happen is this. A B-17, like this one, would come into land, would land successfully, and then would begin its parking roll. It would begin to taxi from the runway back to its parking stand. And at some point along that path, this would happen. All of a sudden, with no warning, the aircraft would simply pancake onto the runway. It would be as if the landing gear had simply gone out from underneath it. And in each case, investigators would try and work out what had happened. And they would look for signs of mechanical or electrical failure. And again, in each case, they didn't find it. So what do you think they concluded? They concluded in each case that this was pilot error, that the pilots had mistakenly retracted the landing gear. I heard a few chuckles when I said pilot error, so I hope that some of you are thinking what I'm thinking, which is, does that, do we know anything more about the accident now? Well, I'll leave you with two things to ponder for now, and we'll come back to this later. The first is that on some level, the investigators were correct. In each of these cases, there was no electrical or mechanical failure. But the accidents kept happening. We'll come back to this. So the structure of this talk is going to be in three parts. First of all, we're going to talk about why we even want to learn from incidents. For some of you, you, you may think you know the answer to this question, but I have a little twist on it that I want you to consider. We're then going to talk about four common traps that we all fall into when trying to understand incidents. These traps are traps identified by a community of researchers who have studied systems similar to ours in other industries, and we'll hear a little bit more about them later. And then we'll talk about four helpful practices 
It's all well and good talking about the things not to do, but it's also very useful for us to know what to do. So I'm going to suggest to you a few steps that you can take in your teams, starting from tomorrow, very easy to apply tools that you can use to start learning more from incidents. So let's get started. Why do we even want to learn from incidents? I know this sounds like a very basic question, but I kind of, uh, in the spirit of the talk from yesterday about uh, first principles reasoning, I want us to really think about why it is we want to learn from incidents. So uh, I know it's 9 a.m. on a Friday, but I'm going to ask, please shout out, why? Why should we learn from incidents? They cost money. They cost money? That's a, that's a great answer. So we don't do it again. So we don't do it again. So this is the most common answer. We want to prevent things from happening. And that is a good and valid answer to why we want to learn from incidents. But I'm going to ask you to consider that there's another aspect to this. Because most of us in the room are SREs. And uh, what does the SRE book say about availability? Does it say that 100% availability is a reasonable target? No, it's not. We don't shoot for 100%. Why don't we shoot for 100%? Here's the thing. Most of the systems we work on are complex systems. They are systems composed of many parts, and often the behavior of the system comes from the interactions between those parts as much as from the parts themselves. And complex systems behave in interesting and counterintuitive ways. And I'm sorry to say, all of the research <laughs> says they are never 100% reliable, and nothing you do can change that. If you find a system that is 100% reliable, it's probably not a complex system. And the gentleman on the right of this slide is Dr. Richard Cook. He's not a software engineer. He is a medical doctor. He's an anesthesiologist and researcher who has spent decades working on safety in complex systems, and specifically patient safety in the healthcare system. In his paper, How Complex Systems Fail, which I strongly encourage you to read, there is a link here in the bottom right-hand corner, and there will be a link at the end, he explains what it is that's common to complex systems in all fields from healthcare to software operations. And I'm going to share just a, a few of the insights from that paper with you, but again, I encourage you to read it for yourselves. Complex systems contain changing mixtures of failure latent within them. What this means is that despite what you may believe, your complex system is never fully functioning. It's always in some state where something isn't working. Complex systems run in degraded mode. This may sound like it's the same statement, but it's actually saying something slightly different, which is while they contain failure all the time, that is the normal state. They are functioning in that state. Your complex system, your cloud, for those of us who run a cloud, is never completely working, but that is normal and that is expected. But catastrophe is always just around the corner. The thing about complex systems is that unexpected interactions between the components in those systems can sometimes create catastrophe. So let's roll back a second. In the context of learning from incidents, what does that mean for us? Well, I posit that it means that there are two things for us to think about when we think about incidents. Both how to prevent incidents from happening in the first place, but also if things will eventually and inevitably go wrong, our ability to respond on the other. These things are interlinked. They're connected. I suspect many people in this room will have had the experience of introducing an automated system which worked most of the time and solved a problem and made our system more reliable. But when it failed, failed spectacularly and in ways we didn't understand and which made it harder for operators to understand what had gone wrong. Now, all of this, now that I've said it, may seem very obvious to you. Um, I like to think that some of the deepest truths are those that seem obvious once we've heard them said out loud. But there is a deeper realization here. The systems that we work on are not purely technical systems. In fact, I would posit that we don't work on the system. Most of the time, we work in the system. Our systems are systems that include humans. And so how the humans respond when things go wrong is as important as preventing things from going wrong in the first place. And this means that language matters. This may be a conclusion that is uh, unexpected or even uncomfortable for some, but the reality, and this is 
the result of research in a number of industries outside of ours, including aviation, medicine, search and rescue, firefighting, and more, is that the words we use affect how we think about failure, how we think about what happened, and can drastically change what and how much we learn. This field of research collectively has become known as resilience engineering. We have a lot to learn about resilience engineering in the tech sector, and we're going to share four common traps identified in the resilience engineering literature. And we'll start by revisiting the story of the B-17s. So I told you the story of these planes, and I told you the explanation that the earlier accident investigators gave, pilot error. Were you satisfied with that explanation? Do you feel like you can prevent these incidents? Do you feel like you understand what happened in these incidents on the basis of that explanation? I see lots of shaking heads. Good. Neither this man, neither was this man. He wasn't happy either. This is Alphonse Chapanis. He is or was a military psychologist who was called in by the US Air Force to investigate the series of accidents when they realized that they were finding the same conclusions in the accident reports over and over again, but the accidents were still happening. And he noticed something. He noticed that these accidents where the gear would somehow retract or the pilots would retract the gear on the landing roll were almost unique to the B-17. There, there were a few other models of aircraft that, that had similar accidents. But one counterexample was a C-47. It's a, a transport aircraft called a Skytrain. There were thousands of them in Western Europe during the, the second half of World War II. And not one of them had ever suffered a gear retraction incident like this. So he thought, there must be something about the B-17. He started to interview the pilots of B-17s. And on the basis of what he discovered in the interviews, he went and looked in B-17 cockpits. And this is what he found. This is the center console of the B-17. The diagram on the left is from the original Boeing manual for the aircraft, and on the right is a, is a modern reproduction. Circled in yellow, on the left-hand side, I think it's... Uh, Switch number five on the left-hand side is the gear switch. And on the right, number six, is the flaps. If you've just landed a plane, your flaps are extended. When you, when you want to park the plane, you want the flaps to be retracted. So one of the things you're going to do on your landing, on your parking roll, is you're going to retract the flaps. But what happens if the switch to retract the flaps is exactly the same as the switch to retract the gear, and they're right next to one another, and they both have the same polarity, so gear down is towards you, flaps, ex uh, flaps extended is towards you. You're going to reach down, and oh, look, now the gear have retracted, and everything's broken. What he had discovered was simply that these two things were too close to one another. Was, they were too easy to confuse one for another. And so Chapanis tried something incredibly simple. He took a bunch of B-17s and glued a little rubber wheel to the switch for the gear and glued a little angular, hard angular flap to the switch for the flaps, and the accident stopped happening by making the switches almost impossible to confuse one for another. Chapanis is now known as one of the founders of the field of ergonomics. Ergonomics is not actually about your desk chair, although that is part of it. It's the, it's the study of design factors in human performance. And he had a simple observation, that the design of the cockpit could affect the likelihood of human error. And this has gone on to inform the design of all modern aircraft. This is what the gear and flaps controls look like in an Airbus A320. Their design, with the gear control that literally looks like gear, it's a little, it's a pair of wheels on the end of a stick, and the flaps sort of look like flaps. They're hard and angular. They're in a different part of the console. Their actuation is entirely different. This is mandated by federal law, because this class of accident became so common that it was important to make sure that we didn't keep making this mistake. I've told you this story to make the single most important point I have for you today. Humans do make mistakes. There's no question about that. But human error is a symptom and not a cause. It's a symptom of issues with system design, organizational design, personal context, and so on. And Professor Leveson said this more eloquently than me on Monday. If somebody says human error, that is a sign that we need to look for those design factors that made that error possible. The human did not think they were making a mistake, and this is why human error is problematic in investigations. 
because it causes us to lose sight of the fact that what they did made sense to them at the time. If it hadn't made sense, they wouldn't have done it. So when we see or hear human error, we need to look deeper. If we want to learn, we must not stop investigating when we find a human error. As the story of the B-17s, I hope, demonstrates, it is often, if not always, just beyond the human error where we learn interesting things about our system. The second trap is counterfactual reasoning. You might not know what counterfactual reasoning is. Don't worry, I'm going to tell you. But you've almost certainly heard it before. Whenever you hear someone, when talking about an incident, say, should have, could have, would have, or someone says that a system failed to do something, that's counterfactual reasoning. Counterfactual reasoning is where somebody is telling a story about a series of events that did not happen in order to explain a series of events that did. When you put it like that, it does sound pretty silly. The problem with counterfactual reasoning is that when someone says the monitoring system failed to detect the problem, the engineer did not check the validity of the configuration, this could have been picked up in the canary environment, if we focus on the things that didn't happen, we're taking time and energy and thought away from understanding how what actually happened, happened. The problem was not detected in the canary environment. Sure. How was it detected? Does the canary environment usually pick up problems like this? How? How do we know? What do the alerts look like? I want to say one additional thing here, because this is a, a point that's been made to me on several occasions. Counterfactual reasoning is fine in certain contexts. If what you want to do is you want to imagine the future, you want to think about how you can change your system in ways that might alter how the incident played out again, counterfactual reasoning can be useful. But here's the thing. Finding out what happened and working out what to do next are two different cognitive processes, and they can interfere with one another. Using counterfactual reasoning when you haven't even established what happened yet is dangerous. The third trap is, uh, is the use of normative language. Normative language is the kind of language that implies that there was an obviously correct course of action that operators should have taken, and it judges the actions of those operators with the benefits of hindsight. Normative language can be harder to detect than counterfactuals, um, but I found that often, uh, if you hear people using too many adverbs, um, that, that kind of gives the game away. When someone says that something was done inadequately or carelessly or hastily, that's normative language. Uh, you might actually hear normative language used in a positive sense. You might hear somebody say that someone uh, paid appropriate attention to the configuration before, before rolling out the deployment. That's also normative. And the reason these things are normative is because they're judging the decisions of operators based on their outcomes. Now, in some circumstances, judging a decision based on an outcome might make sense. But in incident investigation, incident analysis, where you're trying to understand what happened, it's perverse. Because the outcome is the one piece of information that was unavailable to the operator at the time they made their decision. It's the one thing that you can't take into account when understanding how they made the decision that they did. The problem with normative language is similar to the problem with counterfactual reasoning. If we accept post hoc judgments made with information that was unavailable to the humans involved during the incident, we will probably neglect to understand how their decisions made sense to them at the time. Again, if their decisions had not made sense to them at the time, they wouldn't have made them. Which brings us to our Fourth trap, uh, this is what my colleague Jessica calls the meddling kids trap. It's my favorite, and it's mechanistic reasoning. Mechanistic reasoning is built on the fallacy that we work on systems that are basically functioning correctly. And if only those meddling kids hadn't gone and done that one thing, deployed that one busted config, then everything would have been fine. The problem here is that this is simply not how our systems work. We're going to do a little bit more audience participation. If you work on a production service of any kind, 
Please put your hand in the air and keep it there until I tell you you can put it down. OK? Right. Now, imagine the following scenario. Everything in the outside world continues exactly as before. Your customers keep using your system. Traffic keeps growing. Black Friday happens. Anything you want. But you can't touch your system. No code changes, no config changes, nothing. You are not allowed to touch your system. Please keep your hands in the air if and only if your system will still be working perfectly correctly after one day. A few hands go down. One week. A few more hands go down. One month. One year. Anyway, there's still one. I want to talk to you afterwards. <laughs> there's always a couple of people. All right, thank you very much. What most of you have demonstrated here is that the only reason our systems are up in the first place is because of the actions of humans in the control loop. It is only through human action and capacity to adapt to changing circumstances, oops, sorry, to changing circumstances that the system works at all. So it is pretty silly to conclude that the system was basically working if it, or had been basically working if it hadn't been for those meddling kids. The problem with mechanistic reasoning is that it leads us down a path where we believe that finding the faulty component, which is usually constructed to be a human, but finding the faulty component is equivalent to finding the problem. Unfortunately, in reality, and if you come up to me afterwards, I can give you all kinds of wonderful examples of where this is true, that same faulty human has been improvising and adapting to keep the system running for weeks and months. So perhaps there's more going on than just finding the one broken human. Okay. So I hope I've given you some examples of how the language you use and the questions you choose to ask can be critically important to determining how much you learn when investigating an incident. And we've identified a few traps, things to avoid doing. You might be asking, OK, all good, what should I do instead? And so now, in addition to the four don'ts, uh, I have four do's for you, and these are specific recommendations for you to take back and practice in your teams. I hope you will find that most of these are relatively lightweight. You can adapt them to what works in your organization. I'm not proposing a methodology here. I'm just sharing some of the insights of the broader resilience engineering community on what works better. So the first recommendation is to run a facilitated post-incident review. Many of us have probably fallen into the trap of having a single on-call engineer write up a, a post-mortem document. And I can tell you that while that may be useful for certain things, it's not particularly useful for understanding what actually happened. So get participants into a meeting, uh, as many diverse perspectives on the incident as possible, invite comms people, invite everybody who was involved in responding to the incident. The only thing to be a little bit careful of here is inviting people with power in the organization, whether that be managers or executives. Sometimes, having those, always having people in those rooms will change the tone and timbre of the conversation. So you should be very careful before doing that. Um, these meetings do not have to be, in fact, they should not be marathons. Most of the time, you shouldn't go over an hour, and 90 minutes is, frankly, the longest most of us can, can concentrate and participate effectively in a meeting of this kind. Um, and it's important, if possible, that your facilitator was not involved in the response to this incident. I recognize that for smaller organizations, this may be very difficult to achieve. But in general, you should try and have somebody who doesn't have skin in the game with respect to this particular incident facilitating and asking questions. If you're concerned about the complexity of the incident and being able to use the time effectively, one thing you can do is you can prepare with one-on-one -on -one interviews. Have your facilitator or somebody helping the facilitator interview the participants, interview the engineers uh, and the, uh, the other co colleagues of yours who were involved in the incident about their experiences of what happened. The reason to do this is that it allows you to identify interesting things that happened during the incident, perhaps times when people had different views on what was happening, perhaps times when a critical piece of information was discovered that allowed us to, to resolve the incident. Identify these in interviews and then that will allow you to more effectively use time and focus in on the interesting things that happened during your incident during the review. And the last thing I'd say for people who aren't already doing this, if you have a lot of incidents, and I know that many of us do, you don't need to do this for everything. Every single one of these facilitated post-incident reviews you do provides a net benefit to your organization. 
If you turn it into a, a horrendous slog where people are being asked to attend multiple incident reviews a week, people are very quickly going to learn to resent them. So try and avoid that. Um, also, don't necessarily pick the largest incident you've ever had to start doing this on. Pick interesting incidents, um, maybe smaller ones to start with until you've developed the muscle of, of facilitation. OK. So the second helpful practice is asking better questions. We've already talked about how language matters. Well, one thing that you can do is you can avoid asking why questions. Why? Because why questions will often put people on the defensive. We often have this idea as engineers that all that matters is the facts. I can simply ask about what happened. No, that actually, like, you might believe that to be true, but I can tell you the research says it is empirically not true. Because if you ask questions that put people on the defensive, you won't find out as much as if you ask questions that reveal their perspectives. So instead of asking, why did you do that, no matter how nicely you phrase it, ask, what factored into your decision to make that change? Don't ask, why wasn't this caught in Canary? Also counterfactual. Instead, ask, how effective is Canary at catching this sort of problem usually? Remember that each participant in your incident review is going to have a different viewpoint. And that's fine. That's OK. Remember to ask about that. They're likely to have different views that expose different interpretations of the data. And those can sometimes reveal some of the most interesting things in your incident review, times when people say, oh, I didn't realize the system worked like that. That's learning happening, if you hear that. And you will often learn as much by asking about what normally happens as you will by asking about the specific incident in question. So don't focus on only the timeline of your incident. Ask how the timeline compares to normal operations. Ask how the timeline compares to a similar incident that we had last, last week, last month. Uh, how to ask better questions is an enormous topic. I can't possibly uh, explain everything. I don't even know everything, so that, that's definitely a non-starter. But I can't explain everything. For many more suggestions on how to ask better questions, excuse me, I would highly recommend you look at the Etsy debriefing facilitation guide, for which there is a link here. And again, don't worry, there will be a link at the end as well. Third recommendation, and this builds on really critical insights from the resilience engineering research community. Far from our view of incidents as one-offs or products of extreme conditions, in most complex systems, this is a challenging concept, but I promise you it's true, in most complex systems, things tend to go wrong for many of the same reasons that they go right. The system hasn't fundamentally changed. It may have just encountered a slightly different configuration of environment, environmental variables not environment variables, although that's also possible. <laughs> so remember, pay attention to how things right, went right, too. Uh, don't just ask about how the outage happened. Also ask about how we recovered. Perhaps at a certain point in recovering from an outage, there was a critical insight or a tool that a particular engineer knew how to use, or somebody with uh, a developed skill of interpreting a particular dashboard ask about those things and understand what was actually necessary to get us back to working. This comes back to what we said at the very beginning. Uh, we have as much to learn about how to improve our ability to respond as we do about how to prevent outages. So ask about how people know what they know and how they decide what they decide. OK. Last but not least, keep your review and planning meetings separate. A lot of people, when they do post-incident reviews, post-mortem meetings, the focus of that meeting ends up being about the repair items, the things they're going to do to prevent the incident from happen, happening next time. Now, to be clear, repair items are valuable. But when you, when you mix up working out what you're going to do next with understanding what happened, you impede your ability to understand what happened. So keep discussion of future mitigation out of the post-incident review. Otherwise, they will act as a distraction from the purpose of that meeting. And I'd suggest that what you do is you hold uh, a separate and probably smaller planning meeting a day later, two days later, after you've done your post-incident review. If you do this, 
uh, it will allow you to uh, focus down the group on the people who actually have a stake, maybe your tech leads, maybe a product manager, people who actually will be able to understand the relative priority of the things you come up with uh, compared to everything else you have on your plate. Um, and as I say, doing this will help keep the focus on what actually happened. It will also allow you some soak time. Our brains are really good at analyzing information in our subconscious. You just need to give them time. And doing, uh, having a separate meeting to discuss what you're going to do next um, will allow you to identify what I would like to call the most energy efficient repair items, minimum energy for maximum impact. OK. I am very nearly at the end here, with plenty of time left. So I'd like to conclude by reminding you of just three of the most important aspects of what I've shared with you today. The first is that we will always have incidents. The systems that we work on are getting more complex, not less complex. And 100% reliability, 100% availability is simply not achievable and will never be achievable in a complex system. And that means that our ability to respond effectively will always be important alongside ongoing work on incident prevention. Second, human error is a label, and not a very helpful one at that. It is a symptom and not a cause. We learn only when we seek to understand how what happened happened. And I hope the story of the B-17s provides an illustrative, illustrative example of that. And finally, facilitated post-incident review is one of the best tools we know about for learning from incidents. It is one of many, but it is perhaps one of the easiest to apply in your, in your workplace. At its most effective, it can expose not only what went wrong, but what went right and how we can build on that. Thank you very much for your attention, especially in the first session on the last day of the conference. If I have successfully piqued your interest in this topic, you can find resources from uh, our talk, because it is my talk and Jessica's talk, uh, at the link on screen. Uh, and that will also contain links to papers, videos, which go far deeper than uh, I've been able to go today. Thank you very much. So we now, we now have time for some questions. You can either raise your hand or go to a microphone to your right. Anyone? Just want to say thank you very much. That was a fantastic talk. Uh, I introduced a lot of incident review stuff in my company, and I've learned a huge amount today. And I have an incident review today, and I'm going to do a lot of these things. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to say, I had my hand up for quite a long time for the asking the questions. This is not because I'm smug, it's because most of the breakages are introduced by the infrastructure team and my team. So if we're not making changes, things are stable. So just, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, the, the, I will just add one thing to that, which is, um, yes, humans break things, but humans also fix things. And the idea that when something breaks, we point at the human, but we don't think about the fact that they fix it as well, is the central problem of how many of our organizations approach the whole issue of, of how to prevent and respond better in incidents. Uh, making a real investment in understanding not just that the human did a bad, but how the human does their job and whether or not the design and contextual factors surrounding them can help them do their job, support them do their job better, is, I hope, one of the central messages of this talk. Sorry, I had another one, if that's okay. Of course. Um, so the, the idea of 100% reliable, 100% uptime, I'm start, like, it's convenient for me, but I'm starting to think that it's complete nonsense because if you never change anything, generally your breakage level is going to be a lot lower. So I'm, what I'm currently trying to do and failing is to find a metric of success for SRE teams that is not uptime. Because if you were growing, if you were changing your product at all, these things happen. But no, it's really hard to get execs to understand that you, that you, 
you have to, things will break if you're improving things at all. If you keep it completely static, it will be fine. But there's no other metric of success for SRE teams. There are, but they get more and more complex. So I'm just wondering, do you have any ideas on that? Well, I suppose the, the straightforward answer for SRECon, of course, would be SLOs, where the, I'm not necessarily endorsing this, but it is the answer for, for this group, and it is one tool that we've tried to use. And the critical difference, of course, as you well know, with an SLO, is that an SLO isn't uh, intended to be used as a minimum. If you say, my service needs to be three nines reliable, however you choose to define that, which is, of course, a very interesting question, um, you're not saying it should be three nines reliable or more, or you shouldn't be. You're saying, given the needs of the people who use this service, three nines is enough to satisfy those people and to balance their need for reliability with what they're prepared to pay for it, which is always the crucial question. Because yes, perhaps as a user of Twitter.com, I would like it to go down less. But it's also free. I mean, this is probably a bad example for because they're a giant public company now. But like it, in general, right? If you shoot for five nines reliability, and your target audience is college students, I'm going to guess that the, 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 the costings of that do not work out in your business's favor, and thus ultimately not in the favor of the people who's, who you're trying to provide the product to anyway. Now, I will just take a few steps back from this, though, because I think that actually SLOs are not, as many people have actually said at this conference, SLOs are not the be-all and end-all. Nines don't matter if users aren't happy. So I would argue that. Uh, as with so many of the things that I've said today, the real answer is more complicated. We have to take into account the real humans who use our service and what they need and have you know, actual conversations with those people in order to understand what works. And if we're talking to execs who are getting uh, their knickers in a twist about the fact that a, a service is down, well, I'm not ever suggesting that we should turn around and say, well, we're doing our error budget, so it's fine. Like That's never going to work, right? But, but what we should do is exactly what you were hinting at in your question, which is have a grown-up conversation about where the risk comes from, right? Well, you wanted us to ship all of these things this quarter, and we've been slogging our guts out trying to do that, and as a result, maybe the investments that we've been making in reliability and safety and safe rollouts have gone a little bit, you know, gone a little bit astray. Now maybe it's time for us to use this outage as feedback and swing back the other way. We have time for one more. All right. Thanks. Uh, hi, I was just wondering if you could give a bit of clarity on the keeping mitigation discussion out of post-incident review point. Is that keeping the planning of mitigation action items out, or is it keeping discussion of mitigation items out? Uh, both. OK. So um, it, don't get me wrong. This is a hard thing to do, because so many of us are used to going into these meetings where the, the object of the meeting is to come up with a list of things we're going to do. And really, this is one of the reasons why I strongly recommend that you run these incidents with a facilitator, because it can then be the facilitator's job to try when that happens, when somebody says, oh, but if we had done X, or if the threshold had been set differently, then that's counterfactual language, right? You're talking about something that didn't happen. And that's not, it's not necessarily a problem if your goal is to work out what you do next. But for many of the incidents that, that I see, that I work on, if we do that, we jump to conclusions about what actually happened. Sure. And so the, the reason to defer discussion of what you're doing next or the should-haves and could-haves to another meeting is to ensure that you do actually spend the post-incident review understanding what actually happened. And that is, I make no apology for it, a hard thing to do. And that's one of the reasons why having uh, neutral facilitators in these meetings is so important. Thank you. Great, thanks. All right, thank you again, everyone. Uh, I think we're done, Steph, yes? Yeah, yeah. All right, yeah. brilliant.